Good. Well, friends, um, I, you, you'll see this, the picture on the screen, the salt and pepper, better together. Uh, some things just go better together. And uh, this morning, one of the reminders that I have is that it's always good to bring together scripture and prayer. So will you bow with me one more time as we uh, begin to study this passage today? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. And God, as I speak, may your words speak through me in such ways that take root in our lives so that through our lives, the fruit of your kingdom might be born on earth as it is in heaven. In your name we pray, amen. Well, what goes uh, better together? Uh, Does anything come to mind for you? I've been thinking a lot this week about how much I love the church. If you're new, I've been doing this series. I've officially been here a month now. It's hard to believe. In some ways, it feels like it just started. In other ways, it feels like we've been together a lot longer than that. But I'm so thankful for how you and I have been brought together. And I'm thankful for the church that has brought me together with you and with many people throughout time. I'm so grateful for the relationship relationships I have because of the church, and how my life is better because of you all. Some things are just better together. There's salt and there's pepper. What comes to mind for you? Uh, Maybe it's burgers and fries. Someone in the first service said meat and potatoes, and uh, I was watching on Facebook, or I was snooping on Facebook, uh, as we do, and I noticed a friend who took their uh, their son out for dinner. I think it's, he just turned 18, or it was one of those special occasions. They took him to a, a fancy steakhouse, and they didn't say who ordered what, but they showed a picture of the food, and there was this beautiful ribeye steak, juicy, 16 ounce. My mouth is watering, not only because of my allergies, but this image of the steak. And next to this beautiful piece of meat were a bunch of French fries. A different kind of combination, but hey, some things go better together. Meat and potatoes, hamburger and French fries, cookies and milk. There's not much better than Oreo dipped in a glass of milk. Some things go better together. And today, uh, we're exploring that a little bit more through the lens of scriptures and thinking about our own personal experience with God, with church, with creation. Today, we're talking about the God who has created us for relationship, and in particular, we're talking about one of my most favorite subjects. It sounds fancy. I'll try to break it down to you. But if you want to sound smart when you're having brunch down the street this morning, just say really loudly, oh, we talked about theological anthropology this morning in church. It's going to sound really um, hobnobby or, 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 or snooty, but... We're in the back, uh, the backyard of Valparaiso University, right? So <laughs> today we're talking about theological anthropology, and uh, this is my favorite subject. So you might be more familiar with one word or the other, but let me try to explain them a little bit more to you. So theology is the study of God. Uh, theology is one of the things that we do as a church. We study scriptures. We study theology. The, uh, those who've come before us, when we, we, we have these ideas and we discover who God is, we make certain claims, that's the theology part. Anthropology, did anybody take any anthropological classes in in high school or college or somewhere along the way? Oh, quite a few hands. This seems to be um, a, a growing field in the last several decades in particular, but anthropology is the fancy term for the study of humanity, of what it means to be human. So perhaps you've taken a course or you followed along in different places about uh, what it means to be human or to live life to the fullest, there are also specific claims that we make as Christians about what the very good life looks like and what it means to be human. At the beginning of, or toward the beginning of the service, we read a verse from the book of Genesis. And we discover from the beginning of Scripture all the way here to Revelation about this God who has created us for relationship with one another, this God who has created us in God's own image and likeness. Um, 
Last fall, I had the opportunity to travel to, uh, to Ireland with a group of pastors. It was a study tour of, um, of Ireland and Northern Ireland. But one of the fun opportunities we had was getting the opportunity to visit the Book of Kells. Has anyone heard of the Book of Kells or had a chance to see it? Quite a few people. If you weren't aware of it, it was relatively new to me. Uh, the book itself is, uh, was written by monks, the scriptures, with beautiful lettering, calig- uh, calig- calig- now I'm going to say it wrong, calligriog- calligriog- you know what I'm talking about, calligriography, calligriography, uh, can't say it, <laughs> uh, you know what I'm saying, thank you, uh, and, and uh, this beautiful artistic imagery um, surrounding the text, but it was written or composed all the way back in the ninth century, it's a treasure, one of the oldest books and most beautiful books in the world that has survived wars and monks who through the years had to hide it and bring it from one island to another as invading armies were coming to town, it's a sacred and holy book, but it's also one that our culture has appreciated through the centuries. In that book, there are these symbols littered throughout this triquetra. Now, back then, it wasn't exclusive, and even today, to Christians. It often represented this beautiful interconnectedness that we have with each other and with the world around us. Oftentimes it's depicted as one rope that's looping and intertwining throughout it. But it was around that time when these Irish monks began to take the triquetra and use it as an image for God. Do you remember singing that old hymn? God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Yeah. One of our theological claims about God is that the scriptures have revealed God to be the Holy Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's one of the great mysteries of our faith that we can't ever quite wrap our heads around, but we affirm that this is a God, one God, in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in perfect relationship with each other, relational, through and through, all the way down. And so this knot depicts that a little bit, how there's one rope, and the concentric circles overlapping in the center, but three distinct persons of the Trinity, the interconnectedness not only of life, but of the God in whose image you and I have been created. Here's the anthropological claim. If God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, And as Genesis chapter one tells us that God in the beginning created humanity in God's image and likeness. When God created Adam, we hear in the scriptures, it's not good for humans to be alone. And so let us create them in our image. In our image and likeness, God created us. That's the anthropological move. That if God is relational and we are created in this particular God's image and likeness, then you and I have been created for connection. Are you tracking? Okay, I see enough heads nodding that I'm going to keep moving forward. (laughs) When God created the heavens and the earth in the first chapters of Genesis, we hear this refrain. That when God created the birds of the sky or the fish of the sea or the plants and the animals on land, that it was good. And at the very end of the week, God looks at creation and says, this is very good. Then later in the New Testament, a man named Jesus, God the Son, comes to us and we discover him through his own words saying, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly to the fullest. This God of the scriptures wants each and every one of us to have the very good life, the abundant life, the good life of God. And one of the ways that you and I experience life to its fullness is to be in relationship with God, with others, and with creation. There's three different buckets that we discover littered throughout the scriptures, and most particularly in the very opening chapters of the Bible, of this God who wants you, and who wants me, and who wants even the people that we don't like. Please don't look around or point fingers right now. That is not the time for this. 
but to be in relationship with God and with each other and with the world around us. So let me pause here for a moment because this is like academic-y and kind of heady stuff. If you affirm that we are made in this God's image and likeness, which then means that we're created for connection, at least in part, I wonder if you might check in with yourself right now. How is your relationship with God going in this season of your life? It might help you to imagine uh, the gauges behind your steering wheel, or if you've got an electric car and you've got a fancy screen, you can appropriate it for that. I drive a 2010 Toyota RAV4. I'm not there yet. (laughs) But I wonder if your relationship with God is full, empty, or somewhere in between. How about the second bucket? Your relationship with others in the church, coworkers, neighbors, you name it. How are your relationships with others doing? And then the third bucket is one that probably hasn't been talked enough about in most churches for too long. It's our relationship with the earth and with the rest of creation. Where are you at this morning with those three buckets? God has created us in God's own image and likeness, and God, who is a connectional God, desires for us to be in connection that through those connections, we might enjoy and experience the very good life God desires for us. To put it a different way, some things just are better together. Coffee and donuts, this is my favorite. In Revelation that uh, Carol read for us this morning, where did you go, Carol? Uh, Oh, right in front of me. (laughs) Uh, She she read for us from chapter nine. It's one of my many favorite verses in the scripture. And in this one, we get this image that God reveals to the apostle John, this revelation of heaven, of the way things are and the way things one day will be. The book of Revelation was shared at a time when the Roman Empire was at its heyday and and Emperor Nero was persecuting Christians. And so, in order to help disguise some of its messaging, there are these fanatical, uh, 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 fantastic images that sometimes appear a bit scary. Uh, But they're not literal, they're metaphors for what's happening. In this verse, however, the language is pretty clear. It's not as daunting as much of the rest of the book is. Instead, we get this revelation of John who looks around And there before him was a great crowd that no one could number, not even Methodists who track attendance pretty well. They were from every nation, every tribe, every people, and every language. A great number so large that no one could count. In the beginning, God creates humanity for connection. At the end of the story, whether we like it or not, God brings us and reconnects us together through Jesus Christ. And then everywhere in between, we hear these stories of scripture that's bookended by this beautiful, these beautiful images for heaven and, the, and that reveal God's heart with stories about relationships And the times when, like at the very beginning of the story, after Adam and Eve are created, their relationship, their connection with God becomes severed and fractured by their sin and their turning away and their partaking of the forbidden fruit. It quickly devolves after that, even more so, this painful, horrific, awful story of two brothers who become jealous with one another to the point where one murders the other. It's a tragic, it's an awful story that shows immediately right out the gate the brokenness of this world and of our own hearts. But the story, thank God, doesn't end in brokenness. 
but we continue to follow along through both testaments of this God who desires and yearns and works for restored relationship with people and people between one another and yes, between people and the creation with which we are charged to care for and steward. And then there's Jesus. Here in John 15, 15. I don't have a very, I'm not a chapter and verse person, but I can remember this one. 15, 15. It says, I no longer call you servants. Instead, I've called you friends. Friend. Let me pause here for a moment because I'm concerned that more than a few of you in your experience with God or the church or religion have somewhere along the way been given a picture of God that is less than friend. This is not the God who's waiting to punish you and correct you every time you do something bad. If this was the God who zapped lightning down every time you said a bad word or thought something bad in the sanctuary, friends, I wouldn't be standing here today. (laughs) No. This is the God who calls you friend. If you take nothing else from today, I hope it's that truth. Because God created us for connection and God wants to be in relationship with you and with me and for us to be in relationship with each other. Well, let me switch gears but one more time and tell you one of the reasons why I love our United Methodist Church so much is because we are a church that affectionately uses regularly the word connection. Anytime you see this logo of the cross and flame representing Jesus and the Holy Spirit, we recognize that that is a United Methodist Church. Here in Porter County, the counties surrounding us, across state lines, and even United Methodists throughout the world with whom we are connected. And to be sure, like any relationship, it takes work, and it's not easy, and it's hard. And there are times when, like the past several years, those relationships get broken or severed or... I've been using the word divorce because if you have any experience with divorce personally or somewhere in your family tree, you'll know how painful it is. And I've felt very much those feelings about our own denomination's great schism. It's painful and we miss people who are no longer worshiping with us. But our church strives, even through the difficulty, to be a denomination that lives in connection with one another way back when, when John Wesley and those first founders of Methodism began meeting, they were called Methodists not as a compliment, but as a critique. Those Methodists have a method for everything. Even some of you are rolling your eyes this morning. (laughs) But one of the great methods that John Wesley had was to organize our local churches and our denomination in such ways that we become means, or through which rather, become means of accomplishing the mission of spreading scriptural holiness throughout the land. John Wesley recognized that there is a need for organization and systems of communication and accountability and development that he called the connection so that people like you and me might grow as disciples of Jesus, that we might experience to the church the love of God, the love of neighbor, and the care for the rest of creation, that we might experience the very good life God desires for us. And so we try to do that, and that includes here at Valpo First. 
Christopher mentioned at the very beginning of the service, and I want to encourage you and invite you to follow along because just as our students are heading back to school this week or the weeks to come, so too are we about to begin our fall opportunities for you to engage beyond the hour of worship or an hour and 10, depending on how long Pastor Jared preaches. Thank you, Christopher. Christopher. <laughs> to participate in a small group, in a Sunday school class, in a Bible study. Because friends, it's not enough if you only come to worship. You get bombarded just like me throughout the rest of the day and the rest of the week by a whole bunch of other voices that have a very different view in mind than what Jesus has for us and for the world. And if we're not intentional we will let those voices shape us more than the voice of God. And so we need to be involved in worship and we need to be involved in Bible study with others. So after Labor Day, we've got a lot of opportunities. Some are long-standing classes and others are just four, five, six-week opportunities for you to dip your toes in the waters. I encourage you, no, let me put my pastor hat on for a moment. Here to four, I've only been talking as Jared. But as your pastor, I want to challenge you because I love you to grow and to get involved more this fall than you have been this summer. Because through these opportunities and through engagement with God and with your neighbor, we discover the very good life God wants for us. Oh yeah, this is our connection. I forgot this slide. And I forgot this one, and I forgot that one, and then we're here we go. Okay. (laughs) I got so excited, I just completely forgot about the slides. (laughs) But here's the thing. Um, This is my last last story, I promise, and I'll land the plane. I've been telling you about um, uh, different people in my life uh, who have helped cultivate a love for Christ and for his church. And today I want to give you uh, one more, um, uh, not just a person, but a family. Uh, When I was 15 years old, uh, my father, who was adopted from South Korea when he was two, uh, we didn't know his family history. Dad was a collegiate wrestler, never drank, never smoked, at least that's what he tells us. Uh, But dad um, won the genetic lottery. Uh, When he was 39 years old, he had quintuple bypass surgery. 39 years old, no indication of it prior to that. And thank God they saved his life and he continues to be with us today. Uh, But when dad was going through all of this, I was 15 years old in high school, freshman, freshman in high school. Hard enough as it is. I think I had braces that year too. Uh, But dad was in Lutheran Hospital in Fort Wayne and it was about a 45, 60 minute drive back and forth. And there were more than a few nights when my mom stayed in the hospital with him and my sisters and I stayed with different families, friends, church members who cared for us and who loved us. The family that watched me the most uh, was a stayer family. Steve and Ellen were the parents And then Eric and Tara were the kids. Eric was the same age as me. He had one younger sister. I had two younger sisters. Neither of us had brothers. But to this day, friends, Eric and I are brothers. His parents would feed me, and they'd take me to school or pick me up. And they even let Eric and me play his Nintendo 64 a little bit later than we probably should. But Steve... would often hide little post-it notes in my books or my backpack or at the breakfast or dinner table with scripture verses to encourage me, with words to let me know he was praying for me and that he loved me. In a season that everything was unraveling at its seams, The church was there for me because of people like Steve and Ellen and Eric and Tara. I'm so thankful for the church. I'm so thankful for the connections that I have experienced through the church. 
And I'm also reminded this morning that there are other people, even here today, who feel disconnected. And so here's the last challenge. Is there anyone that God wants you to connect with this season? Not for your sake, but for theirs. Some things are better together. And I'm so thankful that you and I are together for this season of our lives. Let's pray. God, I'm mindful this morning that there are folks here in person who might be joining us online who are feeling disconnected. Others who have felt the pain of the church's connection being less than very good. Oh God, our friend, walk with us and heal us that we might through you be people of the connection that you enjoy within your own self, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May we be a people who are growing in our connection to you, to each other, to those who are disconnected with the neighbors in our community, with the world around us, and with all of creation. Oh God, who is making all things new, make us new, that we might enjoy the very good life that you desire for us all. God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for being you. In your name we pray, amen.